I'm Jess, and this is the Ed Voices Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Shannon Wachowski from the Ed Report Science team, and we're going to be talking about some of the challenges that high school teachers are facing and really the role of instructional materials and professional learning that can help support them in the classroom. So hi, Shannon. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Hi, Jess. Um, thanks for having me on. Um, so as Jess mentioned, um, I'm Shannon, and I'm a science specialist um, at Ed Reports, mainly focused on high school science. Uh, so before coming to Ed Reports, I, in a past life, worked as a chemical engineer and then worked in some rural schools in Colorado um, teaching high school science uh, and then also did some work um, with the State Department of Education in Wyoming, supporting teachers with the standards there. That's awesome. Yeah, you have so much incredible experience, and I know you're seeing a lot of this in your role at Ed Reports as well. Um, I'm wondering, you know, why don't we just go ahead and dive into what are some of those challenges that you're seeing high school teachers face, especially when it comes to instructional materials? Um, I think in talking with reviewers that serve on our review teams and just others in the field, some Big challenges that have come up that we've noticed also are number one, that there's just a lack of availability of high quality high school science instructional materials. Um, you know, we just recently are, you know, starting the review of high school materials. So we know that from the every report side, there aren't a lot of reports out there. And then in talking with the field, we just, there's not a, a lot of um, things that have been determined to be high quality. And so that's been one real big challenge. Um, connected to that, we know that uh, a majority or at least 59% of high school teachers make those adoption decisions on their own. Um, and speaking from my own experience as a high school physics teacher, that was my experience also where my curriculum director said, pick a textbook and let me know in two weeks. And that's just the reality. And so um, we really we know that there's that lack of just quality materials to choose from, first of all. Connected to that, um, there's also a lack of professional learning. We know that it's not just enough to have a high quality instructional material, although that's a great first step, uh, and that that professional learning really needs to accompany the material in order to support teachers to think about how they want to use it and how they want to best modify it to meet the needs of their students. And I, and I think that brings up one of the third challenges specifically in high school is just that we know that um, the framework for K-12 science education, and then as a result of that, the next generation science standards have been around for about 10 years. And any and they they call for relatively large shifts in instruction and, and pedagogy, and that, that those changes are challenging. And without high quality instruction materials and professional learning to accompany those materials, it's a real challenge for teachers to make those shifts. Um, they need that network and that cohort of others to really support them. And it's it's got to be a full community effort. So those are really like some of the big three challenges that we're seeing in talking with others in the field. No, yeah, that makes that makes complete sense. And I, I'm wondering, so you really highlighted sort of these lack of supports that teachers have. And when when teachers aren't supported with that high quality curriculum, you know, we know that they're often turning to supplemental programs or creating their own curriculum and getting, you know, materials off the internet that they're, you know, that's what they're kind of pushed into doing, um, whether they want to or not. And I'm wondering, you know, when they don't have those supports, what are some of the, the consequences of that in the classroom? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So we know that about 63% of high school teachers say that they're using supplemental programs as their primary materials. And again, just coming from my own experience, that was my experience as a high school teacher as well. Um, you know, we all kind of know that the traditional version of a textbook may not meet the needs of our students. And so we're always looking for ways to add um, more connections for students in their learning. I think one of the big consequences of that is that because we are all pulling from all of these different sources, a lot of those sources may not be vetted by a third party such as Ed Reports. And so it's it's hard to know if any of those materials are high quality. Um, I think as teachers, we have an idea of what we think high quality means for our students. And I think that's a great place to start, specifically considering needs of local context. Um, but that also puts a really big burden on teachers to not only 
determine if the supplements that they're choosing are high quality. And also, um, maybe if the, uh, the correct supplement doesn't exist, to then create it on their own. And I, I think that's another um, big thing that I experienced as a teacher and that I hear from a lot of other teachers, high school and otherwise, um, is that a lot of educators are writing their own curricula. Um, and so again, while I think that it's really important that teachers be part of that process, they know their students best um, and know how to best meet the needs of their students. It also takes a lot of time and energy to write curricula that is high quality. And so I think what we would advocate for is to see, you know, more high quality materials being produced by research partnerships or, you know, other places where teachers have a role in that, but it's not specifically falling to them. Um, and so, you know, I think that's one way that we can help teachers have those high quality instruction materials have a say in that, but not have it be their sole responsibility. Yeah, and what do you think, I mean, one, when teachers don't have to put all of that time in searching for and creating materials, like what are some of the things that they can then really concentrate on? Well, so I think, you know, allows teachers to do what they do best, which is meet the needs of their students. Um, I know, you know, in my own experience um, as an educator, I would go, you know, I would give up some of my personal time to engage in professional learning with colleagues because I wanted to learn more about how to better meet the needs of my students. And I wanted to form this network of other educators who you know, were also passionate about education and wanted to meet the needs of their students and we could share and learn together. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of that had to take place outside of my, in my work day, my school day. Um, but it provided enough of, of a benefit that I found it really valuable. So I, I think if we can take the onus of curriculum writing off of teachers' plates, then it frees them up to, to do these other versions of professional learning that are really going to fill fill their cup, like play to their passions and allow them to really diversify and meet the needs of the, their students in their local context. Yeah, you know, we've we've really highlighted some of the things that might be difficult for high school science teachers right now. Um, if, if a district were to come to you and say, you know, what recommendations do you have for us? We really want to support our teachers. We really want to help them in their practice. You know, what, what are some of the things we can do to, to get that done? Well, I think that, you know, just based on the fact that we know that a lot of high school teachers do make those adoption decisions independently, I think one of the biggest things would be to really uh, dig into that adoption process, to support that adoption process, you know, bring in multiple stakeholders, support it with time and, and energy and, and finances also, um, to really make sure that those teachers aren't making those decisions on their own. So that's step number one. I think connected to that um, would be to really spend some time on determining as a, as a group, as a district, as a school, what are the key pieces that really play into the instructional vision for your school? What are those things in that in your local context that your students really need that need to be at the forefront of any high quality instructional material? Um, and then once you kind of have those priorities, then you can use things like Ed Reports or other you know other third party independent reviewers to really dig into the materials that are there and use your local priorities as a guide to determine what might be some materials that you'd wanna take a closer look at. Um, so I really think it's investing in that adoption process and highlighting those local priorities that you know are gonna be really important to have in an instructional material. It's great to know how important it is to invest in these comprehensive processes. Um, you know, one thing you had talked about in an earlier question um, that I wonder if you would mind reflecting a little bit more on is also that importance of ongoing support and professional learning. Um, what are some of the things that districts can should think about as they're trying to provide these opportunities for teachers? Yeah, I think, you know, be, besides the adoption process and, and, and all of those kind of initial pieces, once you've decided on a curriculum that you're going to adopt, um, then I think, you know, as you mentioned, that professional learning connected with that instructional material is really important. And um, we know that it also can't be kind of a, 
a one and done type scenario where educators receive professional learning perhaps at the beginning of the school year and then that, that's kind of it. It really needs to be this continuous process, um, ideally where teachers are part of a cohort or a community, whether that's within their school or across schools, um, where they're really in a safe space where they can try things with their curricula, you know, test out different ways of learning with their students and bring those ideas back to that group to really be able to talk about what worked and what didn't so that they can continuously be improving and making changes. One of the issues with that is, you know, when do you do this professional learning? Because it's oftentimes outside of the school day. And so I, I think that is a challenge to contend with in terms of supporting teachers and also providing them with these opportunities where they can really increase their own learning and think about how to support their students with their learning. Yeah, no, I think there's so much, so many sort of things to pull together to make sure that teachers are getting the supports they need, but also they're, they're having that space to do, to do their job and to support the students as well. Um, you know, you touched on this a little bit, um, Shannon, but I wonder if there, if you wanted to add a little bit more about, you know, we're, um, uh, Ed Reports is, is releasing science reviews and high school science reviews. And how do you see these really making a difference for districts and educators? Um, well, I, and I think that's a, been a common thread, but we know that, you know, we're, we're releasing a few high school science reports that that is not solving the problem of providing information to stakeholders around materials that it, it's going to take us time to build up a, a larger number of reviews. Um, so in the meantime, I really think it comes back to identifying those things that are important in your local context and using what is there on in Ed reports. Um, to really identify what's important to you and what's present in the material. Um, you know, right now we're releasing some high school biology reports. And so if that doesn't, you know, if you're a high school physics teacher, that might not really be supportive to you. But what you can use is the rubric, you know, or the rubric that we, we use to evaluate instructional materials. Use that as a guide. You wouldn't want to use the whole thing, um, but to use it as a guide to think about what's important to you in materials. And so it's that combination between maybe things that we think are important and also local local priorities. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, as we know, there will be more and more reports as the future comes. So more and more information for high school science teachers and districts. Um, but as you said, even right now, the tool, the review tool is a really powerful piece that can help support districts as they're thinking about how to winnow their choices. Um, you know, one of the things I know I've, I've, when I've been talking with science teachers recently, um, is that they often, they know the materials they have aren't great, but they want, they aren't always sure, you know, how to get better ones. Do you feel like our reviews could also be a support for them in that way, in terms of like advocacy? Oh, absolutely. So I think, you know, there's a couple things connected to that. I think, you know, we want to put information out there to the field in order to support them to really advocate for what they want to see in instructional materials. And so I think that's a really powerful tool in terms of advocacy. I also think, you know, engaging in the review process as an educator, um, what we've heard from our reviewers is that this is some of the best professional learning that they have participated in. And while I acknowledge that, like, it is outside of the school day, so there are some additional challenges associated with that. It's a it's an intense process, um, but I think it it supports educators to meet a couple of the other requirements that I think really should be out there for professional learning in terms of forming a cohort, you know, building your network of educators that you can rely on and, and talk with, and then also building up that understanding and knowledge of the framework, which is really going to help support pedagogical shifts. And so I think our reports can provide that information to help stakeholders advocate for what they want to see in instructional materials and also becoming a reviewer can help you gain additional information and understanding that's really going to support you in the classroom and to help you advocate for what you want to see in materials. 
there's so you've given me so much to think about. And, you know, as we're as we're releasing more reviews, you know, what we should be ensuring that districts and educators are getting from us to really support this process. Is there, you know, we're we're almost at the end of our time today, but is there anything else that I didn't really ask you about that you think is really important to express about, you know, high school science or what teachers are going through and how, you know, what we can do to really support them? I think I would just say like that we know that teaching is hard. It is hard work. There's so many factors involved. And I know coming from my own experience as an educator, um, I I always felt like there was more that I could do to support my students. And, and I think that probably a lot of educators feel that way. And so I think one of the one of the reasons I love working at Ed Reports is because I feel like we can provide some information to the field that at least helps take a little bit off of the plate of teachers. And so, you know, I hope that the information that we provide through our reports and, you know, as you mentioned, we're going to continuously be reviewing additional programs to really get that information out there. But I hope that that can help, you know, support educators and, you know, other stakeholders in the field of education that we can really work together to think about what's important for students, what do we want to see in high quality instruction materials, and how do we advocate for those things. And so I see it as really a partnership. Um, and I mean, one of my favorite things is to be able to work with reviewers on the review team. And they're such a, they are such an asset to our work um, and to students. And so I think, yeah, I would just end with, we know it's really hard and thank you because we wouldn't be here without all of them. Well, Shannon, it was so great to talk with you. Thanks for giving me some of your time and I will chat with you soon. All right, thanks Jess.